The biggest successes of the articles, and I can't believe how often people screw this up, and you're going to see this in a couple of weeks, and some of you will screw it up again. They won the revolution, the Land Act, the Northwest Ordinance. Those would be the biggest successes. Okay. With the Northwest Ordinance, that should have been the last thing we did. Let's be very, very clear. This will probably be connected to the text, too. Hint, 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 hint. Ladies and gentlemen, the Northwest Ordinance is probably the single most important item because that is going to come in on multiple, multiple units in the future. Folks, whenever anything comes back, you don't want to forget, with the Northwest Ordinance, did we reference the No Slavery Clause? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, if I did not harp or point out that, when the revolution came to an end, there was a massive decline in slavery. Most northern states banned slavery. The Congress bans, and southern states, they don't ban slavery, stop the importation of new slaves. What screws it up? The cotton gin. Ladies and gentlemen, many of the founding fathers actually believed that within 10 years it would go extinct. Tobacco prices were falling. It was hearing that slavery had run it. And remember, what does the Declaration say? All men are created equal. All men. So please understand, when the wood appeared that there was an anti-slavery feeling, cotton will screw that up. Because the cotton gin is invented in 1798, and literally overnight, that will replace tobacco. And cotton reinvigorates the for cheap labor. All right, let's run through this. Folks, why do I have a number of the 13? These are literally the 13 articles of the Articles of Confederation. Do I think you're going to ever see this on the test? No. What will you see? Some of the more important ones as examples. So here we go. Number two and three, in my opinion, for most of you go together. Gentlemen, under the articles, I know it's so screwy, it's called the Articles of Confederation. Most of us, that word is weird. Remember, the Confederate States tried to do that in the Civil War. Under the articles, there are 13 separate, in fact, if you do your math, there are 14 countries, because there is the 13 individual states who individually are a country, and then when they come together, the United States. The biggest thing I want to point out is under the articles, most power rested in the states. When the states worked together, like in the revolution, that was the League of Friendship. Citizenship says is even though that there were 13 states, you are technically not a Massachusetts and you were not a New Yorker, you were all Americans. So even though we did have separate states, there was one type of citizenship. Credit means if you borrowed money in New York, it would follow you into Rhode Island. This one, I'm going to be honest, look at the silliness of this. States could send up to seven. It was up to the state. You had a three-year maximum of six term. Folks, this is the only one that matters. Everything on this is a sham right here. This is probably the single most important item in terms of the articles. Every state gets one vote. Who does that favor? Small states. Rhode Island loved this. Delaware loved this. What state is going to have a fit in the future? Virginia and Massachusetts, because they're bigger states. They have money, population. And what issue is going to be behind this isn't fair? Taxation. Folks, why don't we deal with it here? Think how stupid this was. Under the articles, money was, was raised by the states. How, why didn't anyone fight about representation? Because basically, under the Confederation, you are your own country, right? The only thing you'd ever have to agree on is do we agree to a new general? Do we agree to negotiate with the Indians? And every state had one vote. If you wanted to pay for the army, the government would basically request money. The states would be the ones who would actually have to tax. The federal government has no. If you want, you can put it in big letters. No authority to tax. That would be one of the big weaknesses, all the failings. It's stupid. Why did they do it? Because remember, the entire revolution was based on taxation. So what was the agreement? So they have their own legislatures. The federal government could not. That is what did we say. The number one way the federal government paid for the war is they simply printed worthless paper crap. Foreign relations, I mean, that is the primary thing, is when you deal with other countries, that was normally the Congress. The pick military, that's the whole Benedict Arnold, Horatio Gates stuff. The quorum process also was a problem. Ladies and gentlemen, in the Articles of Confederation, they said that in order for Congress to be in existence, remember, think of the map, the size of America, and what did states learn? If states, kind of like a filibuster, if states did not like what was being discussed, 
The Articles of Confederation says that Congress cannot exist without a quorum of nine. If you were a group of states that did not like the issue being discussed, you just get three or four states to stand up with you, walk out, and the entire Congress would have to shut down. The problem with the quorum is there's nothing wrong with a quorum like for voting or certain decisions. Literally, under the articles, if you did not have the minimum number of states, the rest of the people had to sit around and wait because Congress had to dissolve. The, the quorum number was simply too restrictive. Canada, I love this, so that's why it's here. The Articles of Confederation had an open invitation to Canada to join the United States. Americans could not understand why Canada would not want to be like us. Why would they like England better? I mean, that literally was in the Articles of Confederation. Number 12 is really stupid. It basically, remember when Congress acted like a government, the second Congress began to borrow money. Because the second Congress dissolved, we do not declare it bankrupt. The new government basically took on their responsibilities, their debt, their money. And the number 13 is also an important one. Notice most votes in the Congress, they needed a nine amendments, which means if you ever wanted to change this, like let's say we wanted to add taxation, to add an executive, Please notice, under the articles, there is no exec. The problem with the amendment process is you need a 13 out of 13 vote. You could argue that might end up being the number one reason we don't just fix the articles, because it was almost impossible to get everybody to agree on anything. So what eventually happens is they throw out the articles and they write a brand new document. When you look at this, guys, this is the Articles of Confederation. There are problems, no taxation. The Congress really cannot make the states do anything. If a state doesn't like something, they can simply say, we're not gonna do it, because that goes back to here. Most real authority was in the states. Again, the biggest thing I would look at is kind of what the government looks like. The amendment process sucks. States are well, one vote per, because after all, your real authority is with your state. I will be honest, folks, this is really the end of the experimental period. Um, the reason I am going to give you at least a real quick synopsis is because there's one question on the test. What we see at the time of Daniel Shea is basically paper money and taxation were becoming a problem. The paper money people were given to fight the war had become largely worthless, and states, in order to try to fix the problem, were raising taxes. So think about it. You have money that you were given for being a soldier or a farmer, nobody wanted it. At the same time, the governments were raising tax rates. The big problem that was going across, and this, that is important, this is in Massachusetts. The big problem that was spreading across Massachusetts was foreclosures. The banks didn't want the paper crap. Taxes were being increased. As banks were trying to therefore encourage people to make payments, a lot of people during the war fell behind. People were in danger of losing their homes or their farms. Eventually, this man, Daniel Shea, began to feel that the government should take some responsibility. The government should find a way to help people who had fought in the war, had served their country, you know, not, you know, kind of like today, some sort of a bailout, some sort of a plan. Because basically, the banks operated as normal, and the people were going to be ripped off in the process. What basically happens? is Daniel Shea begins to believe the government is being unfair. Specifically, he believes the government has policies or the banks have policies that are allowing citizens to be punished. They are losing their homes, they are losing their farms, and the government just keeps taking more money. Daniel Shea gets an enormous group of regular people. You know, these are people who are mad that they don't have money, they are mad because they're in danger of losing their home, and Daniel Shea begins to start marching across the countryside. His original target was banks. He began to threaten bank managers. In fact, he will burn some banks because the argument was the banks were behind the financial situation. The banks were behind the foreclosure situation. Well, what happens? Daniel Shea began to realize he had a lot of support. Daniel Shea got so much support that he starts marching to Boston. Daniel Shea decides he's going to overthrow the government. Daniel Shea believes the government of Massachusetts has basically become corrupt and crooked. He is going to overthrow it and create a government more representative of the people. What is so important about Shea's rebellion is the government of Massachusetts, they were divided.
there was a lot of people in Massachusetts in the legislature who actually believed Shea wasn't a bad guy, who believed that what was happening to people wasn't right, and the Massachusetts legislature was not able to get a vote of what to do. The Articles of Confederation had no authority to intervene in state matters. Daniel Shea was leading a revolt in Massachusetts. The state of Massachusetts couldn't figure out. The federal government had no authority to intervene. And eventually what happened is rich citizens in Massachusetts literally pulled out their own money. They formed an army to defend Massachusetts. Daniel Shea will be stopped and arrested. So in technical terms, you could argue that Shea was put down. Ladies and gentlemen, for most people, it is Shea's rebellion that exposes the inherent weakness, the inherent vulnerability of the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation in Shea's rebellion failed to do its most basic job of protecting people. Even if you agree with Daniel Shea that he was doing a noble thing, the government did not have a procedure to deal with or to try to intervene. If we would have kept this government in the future, there would have been more uprising and revolts because basically everything would have been a state issue. 